If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and try to answer the question on your own before listening on. To begin this problem, we can label each charge with a letter just to help us keep track of them. So let's call this first charge A, and then B, and then so on around the ring. Next, we want to draw the electric fields produced by each of these point charges. Let's begin with the charge that we had marked A, which we will note is an electron and is therefore negatively charged. Electric fields point towards negative charges, so we would have an electric field vector pointing in this direction towards the negative charge, and perhaps we can label that E A. For the charge marked B, it is a proton and is therefore positively charged. Electric field lines point away from positive charges, so we would have to make sure we point our vector away from that charge that's marked B, and we'll label that vector EB. Charge C is also a proton, so we're going to point the electric field produced by that charge away from it, and we can label it EC. The next charge, charge D, is a negatively charged particle, so we're going to point the electric field towards that negatively charged particle, and that will be electric field ED. And then finally, we have one more positively charged particle, marked E. We're going to point an electric field vector away from that charge, and so it would look like this. It's going to get in the way of EA, so we'll clean that up in just a moment. So this will be the electric field produced by charge E. Now, we know the electric field produced by point charges is equal to a constant multiplied by the magnitude of the charge divided by a distance squared. We will note that because all of these particles are either electrons or protons, the magnitude of the charge is going to be the same. We can actually fill in for the charge, the elementary charge E. And we recall that E is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. The distance will simply be the radius of the circular arc because we're trying to calculate the electric field at this point right here, and hopefully we can see that the distance to each of these charges is simply the radius of that arc. And so we can leave this marked as R. We'll go ahead and plug in the known value for K as well as for E, and then we'll divide by that radius squared. And the radius was given in centimeters, so just make sure you convert that into meters. And when we compute this, we can see that the magnitude of the electric field that's produced by each of these charges is 3.6 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons per coulomb. So again, that's the magnitude of the electric field produced by each of the five charges. What we have to do is break each one of those electric fields that we drew earlier into their x and y components. So let's take a look at how to do that. So here are the five individual electric fields produced by each of the point charges, and then we have the x and the y components. For the x component, we can simply take the magnitude of the electric field and multiply it by the cosine of an angle. And we're going to talk about that angle in just a moment. For the y component, it's going to be the electric field multiplied by the sine of an angle. Let's consider the electric field produced by charge A. We had labeled that as pointing in the positive x direction, so hopefully we can see that that angle would simply be 0 degrees. So let's fill that in for the x and y components. For the electric field produced by charge B, again, it's going to be E times the cosine of an angle. Let's go back to the diagram and find EB, and here it is over here, and so to find the angle is a little bit more challenging. We were told that theta 2 Note that we were told that theta 1 was 30 degrees, so that would be this angle right there. That's 30 degrees. Now across from that, we have this angle right here. These are known as vertical angles because they're directly across from each other. So that angle also is going to be 30 degrees. Now when we measure our angle, we want to measure it from the positive x-axis, which is right here. And when we draw an arc from the positive x-axis over to EB, Hopefully we can see that that angle right there has to be 150 degrees. And we know that because the x-axis forms a straight line of 180 degrees, and this angle right here is 30, and therefore that makes this 150. However, notice that it's going in a clockwise fashion, and in physics, when we measure angles clockwise, we make sure to label them negative. So the angle is going to actually be negative 150 degrees for EB. And then, of course, the same will be true for the y component, so we'll use negative 150 degrees. Now over to the electric field produced by charge C, which is EC. We can see it's labeled right here. 
we know that this angle, theta 2, is 50 degrees, which means that this angle right here will also be 50 degrees because it's directly across from theta 2. Recall again that this angle was 30 degrees. That means the angle from the positive x-axis over here to EC has to be negative 100 degrees. So we'll have the electric field magnitude multiplied by the cosine of negative 100, and then the y component will be the sine of negative 100. Now over to ED, which is projecting in this direction. We can see from the question that theta 3 and theta 4 are 30 and 20 respectively, so if we add them together we know that this angle would be 50 degrees, which means that measured from the positive x-axis, this angle right here over to ED would be 130 degrees, so that's the angle we use for the x and y components of ED. Finally, over to the electric field produced by charge E, we know that this angle right here, theta 4, is 20 degrees. And then if we go directly across over to here, this is also 20, but if we measure it in a clockwise fashion, it's actually negative 20 degrees. So we'll have E times the cosine of negative 20 for the x component, and then E times the sine of negative 20 for the y component. Next, what we want to do is add up all five of the x components to get the total electric field in the x direction. So you could pick up your calculators and do so. Remember that E was equal to 3.6 times 10 to the minus 6. It might be easier when adding them up to factor out an E and then multiply by that by the sum of all of the cosines of those angles. So that calculation would look something like this. If you substitute in 3.6 times 10 to the minus 6 in for E and then process that calculation, you should get roughly 9.2. 6 times 10 to the minus 7 newtons per coulomb. So that's the total electric field in the x direction. Now if you do a similar calculation for the y components, you should get roughly negative 3.81 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons per coulomb. So notice that the x component was positive, which means it projects in the rightward direction. The y component was negative, so it would project downward. And to get the overall electric field, we would simply use the Pythagorean theorem to get the total resultant electric field. So let's go ahead and do that. And when you do that, you should get approximately 3.93 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons per coulomb. So this is the correct answer to part A. It's the magnitude of the electric field. The angle can be found by simply using a little bit of trigonometry. We're looking for that angle. And so we know that the tangent of that angle would equal the opposite side over the adjacent side. And therefore, the angle itself is going to be the inverse tangent of those values. So when you go ahead and plug in for EY and EX, you should get roughly negative 76.4 degrees. So this would be the correct answer for the direction relative to the positive x-axis.